All right, let's get into the muscles around the hip and the thigh. So let's zoom in a little bit. Let's actually get rid of some of the ab muscles that we talked about in a previous video so that we can see the pelvis and, the, and get to the muscles of the hip region. Okay, so let me get this situated here. So first off, why don't we start with the muscles on the posterior aspect. So collectively known as your glutes, right? And we have three main glute muscles. We have your glute max, your glute med, right? This is going to be more on the, this fan-shaped muscle that spans that iliac crest region. So you are going to have some of that span the front side. Actually, let me remove this arm. Okay, I got most of the forearm out of here. Still got the floating hand, but at least you can see now. So over here, we have your glute med that is primarily thought of as a hip abductor, which is true. But a lot of times we are weight bearing and doing motion. So really what it's doing is it's controlling the pelvis on a stable femur, meaning that it is trying to prevent the pelvis or your level pelvis from the contralateral hip side dropping, right? Because that is still hip abduction. It's just in a closed chain position where your femur is fixed and the pelvis can move over your femur. So don't forget that it's muscle is doing the same action. It just depends which side or which segment is fixed and which side is more freely able to move. So anyway, that's your glute med. So it contributes a lot, not only to lateral movements, but just to create pelvis stability, especially when we're on a single leg. So let's hide that. And then towards the front, this is actually a very superficial muscle. You see your TFL right here, your TFL, and it's going into your whole right iliotibial tract or IT band. But this region right here, this is your TFL muscle. This right here is your iliotibial band or IT band. And it's very important to note that your IT band, I think we misconceptualize this as like a standalone structure. When really you have your fascia around your entire thigh and your leg, your fascia lata, and your IT band just because of tension pulling from these bigger muscles of your glutes, from your TFL, your tensor fascia lata, it creates this thickening of fascia in this region. And it is pretty distinct. So this thickening of your fascia, that is what's known as your IT band, but it's not like a structure that sits on top of these muscles or sits on top of your fascia. It's a thickening of the fascia lata. So that's very important to kind of conceptualize in your brain that the IT band is not a standalone structure. It blends in with the fascia and it's just thicker in this region because of all of the forces and how our fascia adapts as we use our bigger muscles of the hip. So let's hide the IT band in your TFL. And then underneath here, you see your glute minimus. So your glute minimus, I think this is represented a little high on the ilium, but but it's going to sit below gluteus medius and it's going to be deeper underneath gluteus medius. So this is your gluteus minimus. So let's hide that. Oh, this model actually showed the TFL underneath the IT band, but really it's encased by it and it is going to blend straight into your IT band or the iliotibial tract. So this is your TFL, same muscle that we were pointing to earlier. So now let's get into the hip muscles. Let's start on the anterior and medial compartment side. So you have three compartments of your thigh. You have the anterior compartment, the medial compartment, and the posterior compartment. And just like with anything else, these compartments typically share function, share innervation, and they are also compartmentalized to help with force production in the lower body, help for venous return as well. So let's start with the anterior compartment first. So what we are going to see here is we are going to see sartorius. It's that long strap-like muscle. It's the longest muscle in the body. And it has this kind of weird pathway that it goes down the medial side of the body. Then it kind of goes on the medial and posterior to the VMO area. And then it crosses the knee joint and attaches in what we know as the pes anserine area. It is one of three tendons that attaches in that pes anserine area, which again, 
A common theme in the body is when multiple muscles share a common insertion point, then a lot more stress is usually placed on that insertion point and it's more at risk to tendonitis issues, overuse issues. There's a bursa there, so bursitis issues and things like that. So this is your sartorius muscle. And its main function is it's that unique muscle that if you flex your hip, flex your knee, and try to bring your leg on top of your other leg, like you're making a figure four position, that is typically what the sartorius does in isolation. But of course, it provides a lot more support than, and probably some fine-tuned contribution to different types of movements at the knee and the hip. So that's the sartorius muscle. So let's hide that. And then you are going to see, of course, the quads, right? So your quadricep muscles, it's called the quads because it's made up of four muscles. And three of these muscles only cross the knee and we have one muscle that actually crosses the knee and the hip joint, which is your rectus femoris, which sits right on top. You can see it connecting here to your anterior inferior iliac spine or your AIIS. And it is going to blend into your quad tendon up here and into your patellar tendon to attach to your tibia or your tibia tuberosity. So this is your rectus femoris. Let's hide that. Then underneath that, you see the three muscles that do not cross the hip. They are originating on the femur. And you have your vastus lateralis. You have your vastus intermedius. And you have your vastus medialis. Now, what's interesting is you'll constantly hear about if you're in strength and conditioning or rehabilitation, you'll constantly hear about this lower portion of your vastus medialis called your vastus medialis obliquus. And let me see if I can get a good angle here. But in a real quad muscle, these fibers down here really come in at an oblique angle. A lot of this is due to the function, the intricacies of what happens at full knee extension with the screw home mechanism. It probably adapts and is made to help to control patellar tracking at that end range or terminal knee extension. So it is a very unique part of the muscle and you'll constantly hear people say it in shorthand, it'll be VMO for vastus medialis obliquus. So your VMO is a constant part of your quad that you'll you'll come in contact with or be exposed to when you're doing rehab or strength and conditioning work. So this is your vastus medialis. So let's hide that. So we already covered your quadriceps and your sartorius muscle. So now there's only two other muscles that we need to go over. And one of them are your big hip flexor muscles. So I did briefly mention this in the other video, but I will say it again. So you have your psoas and your iliacus that make up your iliopsoas muscles. Now, as I went over in the abdominal video, your psoas muscle, it is lying on the posterior aspect of your abdominal wall. It is behind all of your intestines, all of the arteries, all of the gut organs that are sitting in your abdominal cavity. So with that, it is so deep that it is very unlikely that we can actually dig from the anterior side and actually manually palpate or manipulate our psoas muscle. Now, when you hear about psoas releases or manual therapy things that will loosen up your psoas, I don't think it's actually directly influencing your psoas muscle, but you might be influencing some anterior abdominal wall loosening or things that might indirectly facilitate more hip extension or feeling looser in the anterior hip muscles but that's you know another conversation so anyway just to keep in mind i might make another video showing how deep it actually is when you have your intestines and abdominal viscera sitting on top of it so anyway this is your psoas your psoas minor remember it doesn't cross the hip joint it actually attaches to your pubic bone itself so this is your psoas minor and it has that long tenderness structure that attaches to your your pubic bone and again some people might think why is that there one thought process is that it's probably like a check rein to give you information on pelvic rotation or pelvic tilt because if that starts to tilt too much then you need to support or stabilize certain positions so that could be one of its role it's not going to be a hip flexor necessarily but it will have some influence on that pelvic rotation which again is directly related to 
lumbar positioning and lumbar spine position because when your pelvis rotates it's taking the lumbar spine with you via the SI joint so anyway this is psoas minor let's hide that let's hide your psoas major you can see how it's crossing the hip joint going behind the inguinal ligament and it's going to attach to that lesser trochanter of the femur so let's hide the psoas major then you have your iliacus which is another strong hip flexor you can see the path connecting from the ilium to the lesser trochanter of the femur as well. So let's hide that. And that is the iliopsoas group. The last muscle of the anterior thigh is your pectineus. So it is this muscle in the front here. And this does contribute to hip flexion as well. Can also contribute to, you can see the line of pull more into adduction into internal rotation as well but this is your pectineus muscle so those are the four muscles of the anterior compartment of the thigh you have your iliopsoas your pectineus your sartorius and your quadricep muscles now moving along to go on the medial thigh muscles this is where you have your adductor group right we all know them collectively as adductors but it's good to break down what's doing what and especially when we talk to one of them, they, act, they can act as a hamstring in some sort of way. So sometimes if you're feeling hamstring tightness or you're experiencing problems in your adductor area, it could be dysfunction in how you're actually using your hip muscles or your adductor muscles, could be related to some weakness, could be of course overuse and functional limitations that you have, but this is good to kind of break down all of the adductor muscles. So what we have here is, the majority of these muscles are attaching from your pubic ramus here to the medial aspect of the femur. And what we're going to see here, I'm actually gonna start, once you see the medial thigh muscles, you're gonna see this long strap muscle like that's attaching all the way from the pubic ramus all the way into your pes anterior, and that is your gracilis muscle. So this is your gracilis muscle right here. Remember, it's one of the three tendons that's attaching into your pes anterior. So this is the second muscle that I'm going over. Sartorius was the first. So let's hide that. And then you're going to see, it looks exactly like this. So you're gonna have your adductor brevis, which is brevis is the smaller muscle of the two, right? If there's a brevis, there's a longest. So you're gonna have your adductor brevis right here. So let's hide that. Then you're gonna have your adductor longus. And then you're gonna have your adductor magnus with this adductor hiatus down here because that's where your femoral artery is going to transition from the front or anterior aspect of the thigh down behind your knee so that it doesn't get stretched whenever we do knee flexion. So this is your adductor hiatus for your femoral artery and the neurovascular structures to pass behind the knee. So this is your adductor magnus. And your adductor magnus is unique because it is a very strong and most powerful adductor muscle, but also this part that attaches to the adductor tubercle, this part of the muscle functions like a hamstring and it can help to extend the thigh. Now what's even more interesting is that the medial compartment muscles, they're innervated by the obturator nerve. So the adductor part of the adductor magnus, that is innervated by obturator nerve. And the hamstring part, the part that attaches into this adductor tubercle area, that is innervated by the posterior compartment nerve, which is your tibial nerve. And it functions like the hamstring and it is innervated like a hamstring muscle. So that is an interesting fact. It's almost termed as like the fourth hamstring muscles I've read in some books. So, you know, it's just to know that this strong adductor muscle, it does have a hamstring-like branch that can help to extend the thigh. It can act on the knee because it's not crossing the knee joint, but it can help to facilitate hamstring function, especially when we're talking about trying to extend the hip. So that's the adductor magnus, let's hide that. And then we have only one muscle to talk about in the medial compartment. So let me get centered here. And it is going to be the obturator externus muscle. So we have here, this is the obturator foramen. And that is where your obturator externus is sitting on the external side of that foramen. And it is one of the deep external rotator muscles. Let's see if I can maneuver this to kind of show. So I'm gonna highlight it here. This is your obturator externus, right? And then it attaches as one of the deep external rotators 
and you can barely see the blue because it's underneath all of these tendons here, right? But if I remove quadratus femoris, then you're going to see this is obturator externus. Okay, let's undo that for a little bit just so that we can go over this. Okay, so that's your obturator externus and that is also considered a medial thigh compartment muscle. Okay, and last thing, you see one more muscle there, and this, I think it depends what books you're reading. This wasn't heavily emphasized when I was taking anatomy, or maybe I just overlooked it, but this is your adductor minimus that contributes to the adductor group, but depending on your anatomy textbook, and I'm not even sure if this is one of those muscles that are non-existent a percentage of the time, but this is your adductor minimus. So let's hide that. So now you can see, okay, we got everything empty. Now we see the hamstrings in the back of the thigh, and then we see the deep external rotators. The one thing that I wanna go over So I'm going to remove some of the muscles on the left side of the body now. So let's get rid of these hip muscles. On this side, I want to get rid of your hamstring muscles. So what I'm going to show you is, so your hamstrings basically have medial hamstrings and lateral hamstring muscles. And you are going to see on the lateral side, you're going to see biceps femoris. Biceps femoris, if I remember correctly too, I think it's one of the stronger muscle groups in the hamstrings. It can be overutilized, especially when you have some knee dysfunction or hip dysfunction because it will help out your hip muscles. It will also cause some knee rotation too, which may be beneficial or detrimental. But anyway, this is your biceps femoris. You have two heads of your biceps femoris. Your long head, which spans all the way up to the ischial tuberosity where it originates, and then your short head, which I can't separate the two right here, but your short head attaches to your femur and it's sitting right underneath your long head. So this is your short head right here. You can see how it's attaching into the femur around this area. So that's your biceps femoris on the lateral side of your hamstring. Then on the medial side of your hamstring, you have your two muscle groups. You have your semi-tendinosis, and this is the long tendon that this doesn't really do its justice, but the tendon is usually really long before you actually see the muscle portion of the semitendinosis. But this has a long tendon that is typically used for your ACL or anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction if you take a hamstring graft. Sometimes they use this and part of the gracilis, but this is one of the things that they use. They loop around to make a bundle and then they use that to reconstruct your ACL. So that's your semi-tendinosis. And then on this side, you can see very different characteristics. The tendon is not as thin and tendinous. You see a big muscle belly and that's why this part of the hamstring is called your semimembranosis. So that is the two muscles on the medial side, semi-tendinosis and semi-membranosis. So let's hide this. Now what I wanna show you here, so we see adductor magnus, right? This is the posterior aspect of the femur already. And if you look at this, look at how much muscle belly and cross-sectional area your quad muscle is extending all the way around your thigh. And even if I remove this IT band, this is your vastus lateralis right here. So a lot of times when you're rolling out the lateral thigh and you're thinking that you're rolling out your IT band, really you're just rolling out your vastus lateralis because look how much it wraps around that femur, right? I think that's what we intuitively kind of mistaken is that our hamstrings and our quads are taking up equal space around the thigh. But no, your quads have a lot more cross-sectional area. They're making up a lot more of the girth of your thigh. And then of course your hamstrings, you can kind of see and compare, right? Let's take away the adductor magnus, right? This is your adductor group already, but you can kind of see, this is your hamstring group. This is vastus lateralis and they sit right next to each other. And that's what makes up the muscles of the thigh. All right, so that is the muscles around the thigh. So the last thing that we need to go over is the deep external rotators of the hip. So let's go back to this right side of the body. Let me get rid of some of the ligaments so we can see and get a better view of what we're looking at here. You have all of the 
strong ligaments that you learn about in anatomy. I won't go over that right now. Okay, you see the pelvic floor that we talked about before. Actually, let's get rid of the pelvic floor so we can kind of see the obturator internus. Pyramidalis, that was that muscle on the right next to your rectus abdominis. Okay, I think that should suffice. So this is your obturator fascia, which is covering that. Now you're gonna see obturator internus. Okay, so these deep external rotators, there's six of them. What I want to make mention of, I think this animation makes them a lot beefier than they actually are. These muscles are comparable in a way to the rotator cuff of the shoulder. However, as we talked about the rotator cuff of the shoulder, remember that it really has to provide a lot of dynamic stability. Whenever we do overhead athletics, throwing sports, it has to really be strong and beefy to slow down our arm to prevent our humeral head from rolling out of the socket, dislocating, or just injuring other passive structures as well, ligaments, labrum, etc. And that's just the nature of the shoulder, right? It is very incongruent in nature. It's very passively unstable. That is the opposite in the hip. The femoral head and the acetabulum, they are very congruent. This is a true like ball and socket joint where the femoral head is up in the acetabulum and it is surrounded by the acetabulum. Yes, you have a labrum just like in the shoulder, but really it's the bony connection that makes this really passively stable. Because of that, you don't need a lot of dynamic stability, or I should say as much dynamic stability as you do in the shoulder. So when you look at this, these six deep external rotators of the hip, they are relatively small in comparison to all of the big hip muscles, the glutes, the adductors, the hip flexors. These muscles are very small. You just think, how are they providing any stability? And that's probably true, they're not very big force producing muscles that can do what the rotator cuff does in the shoulder. The rotator cuff muscles in the shoulder are way bigger and beefier than these deep hip external rotator muscles. And you think that the hip and how much force we're producing through the leg, wouldn't we need a lot of musculature there? But more so, I think whenever you see that muscles are not strong force producing muscles, they have that proprioceptive row again. So these muscles are probably relaying a lot of sensory and kinesthetic information back up to the brain to help our bigger muscles control the movement of our hip better and to keep our hips in a safe position, keep them absorbing force, firing at the right time, making sure that we're adequately moving so that we don't injure our hips. So these muscles, although they're not very big and beefy, they are contributing a lot of information to maintain normal and sufficient hip movement. So let's go over them really quickly. And once you get oriented, you'll have a pretty good idea as to what you're looking at. So again, the first thing you need to know and orient yourself with is that obturator foramen. That obturator foramen is the foramen or the opening right here. And this is where you can orient yourself first because this is your obturator externus muscle. And you'll see this as soon as you kind of split that pectineus and adductor brevis, you'll see this window, and then you'll know that you're in this window because it's oriented so far going posteriorly, where the other muscles are coming more in this kind of, I would say, frontal plane kind of angle. This is jetting back in this oblique angle, and that is your obturator externus. So now, if I take this, Obturator externus, you can see it's going into the back and that's the one that we saw before. Actually, I won't delete it yet. That is your obturator externus. Right here, this is on the internal side of the obturator foramen. This is your obturator internus and it's characterized by this long tendon that goes around the bone and then it's going to jet across to attach with the rest of the deep hip external rotators. So that's your obturator internus. So let me hide that for you. And then your obturator internus tendon is surrounded by your gemellus muscles. And you have two of them, so they're gonna be characterized by location. So you have your gemellus superior right here. Let's hide that. And you have your gemellus inferior. Okay, once you get that, then you'll be 
kind of in the landmark to identify everything else. This one is the famous muscle that gets a lot of, lot of the blame for sciatica because I don't have the nerve here, but your nerve will either pass right under it. In occasional cases, it might pierce through this muscle, but this is your piriformis. So let's take the piriformis and let's hide that. This very distinct muscle that looks like a square or a rectangle is called your quadratus for the shape femoris. So this is your quadratus femoris, so let's hide that. And then you're gonna see the tendon of your obturator externus, which is the thing that I started off first. Let's see if I can get a better angle. Obturator externus, coming around the back, right? So let's hide that. And those make up your six deep external rotators of the hip. And since we're here, I'll just leave off with this. I'll get rid of all of the ligaments. Uh, I won't go into that in depth, but just to show you, get rid of all of this. This is your labrum depicted right here. But you can see how the femoral head is sitting in the acetabulum with these really, really strong ligaments in the front, right? A little bit more lax ligaments in the back so that we can flex our hip and do all of the things that we need to with range of motion. But again, this is why these muscles, the deep external rotators are not as bulky and thick and strong as you think, but it likely contributes a lot to that proprioceptive and kinesthetic information that helps us to maintain proper movement and allows for adequate hip control. And those are collectively all the muscles of the hip and the thigh.